Like recent video games, I found myself pining for the glory days of the mid to late 2000s, when the world seemed to be going in the right direction, social media hadn't yet taken control of culture, and women were skinny and sad. These days, they're just sad, along with everyone else it seems. But even in a time of dystopic melancholy, you can still score a few easy wins, such as remaking games from that era that are still perfectly fine, all of which serves to add a .5 to the already solid 8.0 I would have scored to the original Dead Space. There can't be an easier layup than making a few quality of life improvements to an already solid game and selling it at full price. There are a lot of improvements worth mentioning. Dead Space looks great and sounds even better, but those are the easiest things to improve in an old game. More important are the transitions between areas of the ship which are now seamless and combat feels snappier and more aggressive along with an AI director system that will cause random events to happen to keep your guard up. Oh, and the main character can talk. So they squared away that issue and pulled the rolled sock out of Isaac's mouth he had stuffed in there the first time. All of that gets a big ol' thumbs up. Now if EA only managed to make the game scary, we have a real occasion to celebrate. Since the one thing that held the original Dead Space back is that I just didn't find it scary. But I admit that might just be a me issue. The days when a game could unnerve me seem well and truly over. That being said, I've never found loud scary. Startling, maybe. But a T-posing mutant can only jump out of an air vent and scream so many times before it becomes my expectation upon entering every room. You see, horror is like Mormon foreplay. It's all about the anticipation, and then barely seeing anything through the holes you've poked through a sheet. In a good horror experience, you know the shambling abominations are there. You just don't know when they're gonna come at you. A game needs to wait until you've fallen into that safe mindset, and then rip it away from you and push you out the door into a situation you barely have enough supplies to survive. Atmosphere and anxiety is built only by your imagination when Place in an environment that licks the earlobe of the deep and primitive part of your brain that is hardwired for paranoia. And I'm sorry to disappoint the myriad of game developers out there, but a flickering light on a gunmetal gray corridor doesn't do it for me at this point. Dead Space and now the remake never establish an atmosphere that's conductive to that type of horror because it has no patience. Monsters have to continuously assault you in every room in which their arrival is announced with a warning klaxon as the doors lock and lighting changes to red, at which point I'm just playing Doom in third person. Not to say that isn't fun, cutting off the legs of an enemy so it can't move and then picking off each of its arms is not only enjoyable, but shows that all of us, given the right circumstances, can turn into the creepy kid who pulls the wings off insects. I'm struggling to come up with truly negative things to say about Dead Space, so I guess I settled on the theme of damning by faint praise. It's fun, but not scary. I enjoyed it, but I think I would have enjoyed it more had it managed to unnerve me. You play as Isaac Clark, but this time around he can speak. But that in itself is no great addition, because Isaac is basically the equivalent of casting Mark Zuckerberg and directing him to channel his congressional questioning. He's stiff and never sounds that interested in the monsters trying to kill him except for when he's stomping one. The rest of the cast is more or less the same. Just aged up. There's a lack of charisma all around, and I think it has to do with the way Dead Space involves them in the plot, because everyone is kept at a distance from Isaac, either through a video call or by separating them with a wall of glass, or in the case of the villain who likes to freeze Isaac in place with stasis so he can't talk back to him. It all feels coldly impersonal, like a zoom call with hand puppets. This is the kind of storytelling you can get away with when the main character is mute, but they've upgraded Isaac with a set of vocal cords who can do more than swear at things he plants his foot on. Why would you not take the opportunity to have at least a majority of character scenes take place in the same zip code? It's all falling apart here. I can't believe what's happening. This is not exactly the kind of message you would send when you are minutes away from committing suicide due to the hopelessness of your situation. Nicole has been trapped on a spaceship with monsters killing everyone around her and she talks about the situation like the company just cancelled the staff pizza party. Begin with the fact that there are monsters killing everyone, then lead into how stressed you are. Also, if Nicole could send this message to Isaac so easily given the situation on board the Ishimura, how are there no other messages about the situation ever sent out by the rest of the crew? That's her? Nicole? Yeah. First deferred from her in weeks. The first one he's had of her in weeks, and he never takes a moment to watch it after being interrupted. It was dumb a decade ago, and it's still dumb today. We're five minutes out, you still got that thing on repeat? Guess you really miss her. Actually, Daniels mentions that Isaac has been watching the video on repeat, so how Isaac would be clueless of Nicole killing herself is a total mystery, unless the game is implying Isaac is suffering from a very stable form of emotional shock and shows zero signs that he's coping with Nicole's suicide by repressing it. Who exactly activated the gravity tethers to dock the ship with the Ishimura and then almost killed all of them due to the guidance system? I don't believe there's anyone on board with the authority, desire, or capability to do that. Pulse rifles have to be the most uncomfortable and unwieldy looking rifles I've ever seen in fiction. They're just a big metal tube connected to an uncomfortable shoulder stock with a bizarre tri-barrel on the front, and instead of a scope or proper sights, it sticks a low-tech straight out of World War I iron sight on top of it. What makes sense for the player makes it unusable tech for the in-game characters, as the rig they all wear on their spine make it impossible to monitor their health and energy status without asking someone to look for them. It's like a diabetic strapping his glucose monitor to his neck. Hazardous anomaly detected. Quarantine activated. 
detected. Whenever a hazardous anomaly is detected, the room is quarantined and locked down. This is a pretty extreme method since the only way to lift the lockdown is to destroy the anomaly with extreme prejudice, which makes catching the flu a possibly lethal situation as your crewmates have to beat you to death just to get out of the mess hall after you throw up on the floor. It should also make it impossible for necromorphs to get around the ship, but the lockdowns never seem to stop them. The necromorph that kills Chin pops up right out of the floor where there is no floor grade or hole for him to pop out of. Ask yourself, would you ever use an elevator if you knew the elevator door could close with enough force to split you in two? The plasma cutter is the main character of Dead Space as far as I'm concerned. I appreciate when a game makes the starting weapon one you never stop using even once you obtain others. There's more identity in this weapon than Isaac ever develops across three games. If you recall, I sent how stupid security was inside a prison in Callisto Protocol, where you could override any door by prying off the wall cover next to it and cutting a ribbon cable. That must have been another idea they lifted from Dead Space, because there's quite a few doors that can only be opened by shooting a glowing fuse next to it. I like the combat of Dead Space. I really do. Delimming enemies to bring them down is still a solid idea even a decade later. I won't pretend that Dead Space invented the idea of aiming for limbs, since I spent most of my time in Resident Evil 4 putting rounds into the kneecaps of Ganados, but I will allow that it did lay claim to it by focusing on the idea and building weapons to facilitate it. One thing that I have never found a satisfying answer to is why shooting a necromorph's limbs is the preferred method of killing them over body and headshots. It doesn't make a bit of sense unless their brain is in their shoulder socket. I honestly believe they should toy with the idea that you can't kill a Necromorph, only stop it from attacking you effectively, having a bunch of severed limbs blindly crawling along the floor, while the immobile torso and head glares and snaps at you as you walk past might go a ways toward fixing the issue of the game never being scary to me. Since I made a big stink over Callisto Protocol failing to deliver even a satisfying stomp in their Dead Space clone, I suppose I need to report on the stomp in this remake. I'm satisfied. I don't think it's quite as heavy as Isaac's original dismembering meteorite of a foot, but it comes close. Any differences are likely due to this remake not using the same ragdoll physics engine. Daniels is looking down at her wrist, where I presume the camera that's broadcasting her is located. But in the broadcast, both she and Hammond are looking straight ahead at a camera that is eye level with them. After getting the tram working to send Hammond and Daniels to the bridge, Isaac returns to the Killian to attempt repairs on it. In the original game, the ship exploded randomly for no reason, which I honestly thought was fine since it was a crashed ship after all. But remakes bring opportunities to add context where none is required. So now, some necromorphs snuck through the open door, ignored the tasty human with a broken angle at the controls just feet away, and proceed to attack the ship's singularity until it explodes. Isaac defies the laws of physics by changing direction midair after being blown out the cockpit by the explosion. It would take a left angle turn from his trajectory to land on the catwalk. Medical's a slaughterhouse. They barricaded access to the morgue. The morgue? Yeah. But the barricade was put together in a hurry. A hydrazine tank might blow it open. Just need a detonator, like maybe a shock pad. Why would you need to build a barricade to keep anyone from entering or leaving the morgue in medical? The ship already has a quarantine and lockdown system that activates when it detects necromorphs. Isaac has to build a bomb to get through it by collecting a defibrillator and a tank of hydrazine. I guess he forgot his pulse rifle has a grenade launcher on it, or the fact that his plasma cutter was originally meant for welding and cutting through metal. Whenever Isaac steps into the store vending machine to get a new suit tack welded on, we should hear nothing but screams of pain since the pieces are attached while he's still inside the suit. Later on, you even come across a store where someone died inside it. The computer says the Ishimura's engines are offline. We're on a decaying orbit toward Aegis 7. Oh god. I have to get to engineering. The ship is in danger of crashing into the planet since its engines are down. But not to fear, Isaac can fix it all on his own in a short amount of time. I wouldn't be sending this if it weren't for an earlier line of dialogue Isaac said before his team arrived on the Ishimura, where he stated that the Ishimura's comms were down and that he and his partner would be able to fix it and have it back up and running in 48 hours. If it takes two days for two people to fix broken communication equipment, I have to imagine fixing fuel lines, a centrifuge, and restarting a dead starship's engines is something that would take a full team working inside a specialized repair dock. Both Callisto Protocol and Dead Space hit on the idea of having a creepy monster jump scare you while crawling through a narrow meat crevice. I'm gonna need your help. I am not losing the Ishimura. Not now. The Ishimura Hammond or the marker? That artifact they found? Don't bullshit us. CEC knew all along about the marker, didn't they? Isn't that why you're really here? Corporate wouldn't send the Ishimura for some off-the-books mining. But alien technology, yeah. That bit. Daniel starts giving Hammond a rough time, accusing him of being here for the marker on the orders of the CEC, the corporation that owns the ship, but Daniels is actually the one who is here to covertly deal with the marker. There's really no reason to start a conflict with Hammond that she made up. Because Hammond can't bring himself to kill Chin now that he's a necromorph, he ejects the escape pod he captured him in instead, which now means you have no escape pod on this dying ship that is now headed toward an asteroid filled with no protection. I found a CEC executive keycard. I'll upgrade your clearance. Security clearance upgrades are a method of keeping Isaac from going where the game doesn't want him to go. It makes no sense for him and not to upgrade Isaac to level 3 right away, but instead doles out the clearances as needed. 
Sparking electricity causes cables to move around like an unattended fire hose spraying water. Shooting an asteroid coming at you doesn't actually do that much to improve your situation. All of the mass of the asteroid is still there and headed in your direction. It's just that now it's in smaller pieces that you can't shoot and will still shred your ship apart. This is Senior Medical Officer Nicole Brennan. Medical is a sanctuary. They receive a broadcast from medical that informs all survivors to head to medical because it's a sanctuary. Dr. Mercer used the recording of Nicole to lure Isaac here, but I'm struggling to come up with a reason for why he would. Drawing attention to himself serves no purpose. His plan is now to bring the Ishimura to Earth now that Isaac fixed the engines, or so he claims, because he never does anything from here on to take control of the ship. Dr. Mercer must have heavily upgraded his stasis ability, because it lasts for several minutes and stops Isaac from moving at all instead of just slowing him down. But even if I was to ask, I suspect you're not the talkative type. That's where you're wrong. Isaac was upgraded this time around to be able to speak back. It's just that they don't use it very effectively. Try and relax, Mr. Clark. Convergence is so close. Maybe your death will tip the balance. Mercer could just shoot Isaac in the head with his gun while Isaac can't move instead of sicking the hunter on him. At the very least, hit him with stasis again to make sure he can't run when the monster comes after him. Not me. Save hydroponics. We're all dying. Air's poison. But there's still time. Her enzyme will work if... <coughs> she just needs liquid nitrogen. A dying man brings up a new problem for Isaac to solve. Apparently the ship's air is being contaminated, and a doctor in hydroponics has a plan to stop it with an enzyme. I'm pretty sure you could just stop any air from being pumped from hydroponics instead of going there to deal with the source. A ship like the Ishimura would have to have advanced life support systems with the ability to lock down sections in case of hull breach. Cutting hydroponics out of the air circulation should be doable. At the very least, you could seal all the doors leading into it, then open a hatch in there and suck it all out into space. Dr. Mercer tries to kill Isaac by gassing medical. I guess he forgot Isaac is in a suit with its own oxygen supply, and there are oxygen stations along the walls. If this is hydroponics, how come I only see plants growing out of plots of earth? I find it more than a little unfair that Dr. Cross can survive indefinitely inside hydroponics with her gas mask, but the best Isaac spacesuit can manage is little more than a minute inside any room with toxic air. My team has been altered. They're all connected to the Leviathan, breathing out its toxins. That connection goes both ways. Okay, so if I get to your team and inject them, the enzyme will be carried right into the Leviathan's heart. How would you know that your mutated team's connection with the Leviathan goes both ways? You're asking Isaac to put his life on the line for this theory. Weezers are immune to physical damage for no good reason. If Isaac can disable a hunter with its regeneration powers, there's no explanation for why he can't even damage a Weezer. Isaac, where are you? There are several scenes in this game that are written as if Isaac still can't speak. Isaac receives a plea for help from Nicole that he doesn't even respond to, really making good use of Isaac's new ability to speak this time around. Also, Isaac should question how Nicole would even know he's on board this ship. They wanted to get their mileage out of that tentacle scene, so they have it grab him multiple times throughout the game this time. Oh, come on. Where's Hammond? What's he doing? Daniels makes a good point. Hammond has no reason to be radio silent, and when he pops up again, he's just crawling through some vents on the crew deck. The airlock's open, but the Leviathan's too strong. It's clinging to the interior of food storage. We need more enzyme. There's no time. I'm going in. Maybe I can cut it loose. The Leviathan has a 10 kiloton mass. Do you really need me to tell you this is a bad idea? How many people were on this ship for the Leviathan to have 10,000 tons of biomass and still have enough left over for all the necromorphs running around? I also have to question why food storage has such a gigantic airlock at the back of it and why you would store the ship's food supply in a giant cylinder with no gravity and direct access to space. Listen, Jacob, my Jacob, last I heard he was on the mining deck with some other survivors. He said they were building an SOS beacon. Cross sends Isaac to the mining deck to find her boyfriend who was trying to send an SOS beacon to call for help. That was a while ago, and rig links just never work for anyone looking for someone specific on this ship, because the guy's alive but apparently can't communicate. Come to think of it, Isaac never once tried to contact Nicole by her rig once on board either. Where are you? In the vents, hoping they don't hear me. When you consider that most of the necromorph spawn by jumping out of vents, I highly doubt Hammond could sneak around inside of them and not be killed. Oh my god, I can't believe you're here. I 
thought I'd never see you again. Isaac finally runs into Nicole. And you know, the twist that Nicole is actually dead and that this is just the marker playing with Isaac's mind worked way better when Isaac didn't speak. Now that he can speak with her, he just seems really gullible for buying it. There's also a new twist that this isn't just an hallucination of Nicole, but Isaac seeing another person as her, Dr. Cross, who is the one who asked Isaac to head to this part of the ship to find her lover, even though she can apparently reach it and explore it all on her own just fine. There's so much I need to tell you. I know, we'll have time, I promise. Let's get you that beacon. Everyone's counting on us. Nicole is helping Isaac retrieve the signal beacon to radio for help, which is an odd thing for the marker to assist Isaac with. Nicole helped me out. N Nicole's there. We got separated. She'll find her way back. She's a trooper, huh? Daniels knows the truth about Nicole's fate. I'm guessing she must have hacked Isaac's files and watched the full vid he played earlier on the ship, but she doesn't reveal the truth to him right now, despite knowing that the marker is using him. What was that? The miners must have booby-trapped the launch tubes, too. Why would the miners booby-trap launch tubes of all things? It's a tube that fires something into space. What exactly is going to come in through one? Well, that's great. We can't just toss the beacon out a window. Actually, why can't you just toss the beacon out a hatch? I see no reason why not. The signal beacon is going to broadcast regardless. Orbital velocities will ensure it gets very clear of the Ishimura, which for some reason the presence of will disrupt the signal. So instead, Isaac has to attach the beacon to an asteroid the miners were extracting ore from and launch that. I'm aligning the... Wait. A ray receiver not responding. Oh, shit. The comms array. We never fixed it. It turns out to be for nothing because the beacon doesn't work because they never fixed the comm array Isaac mentioned earlier. I'm not sure why the ship's comms array needs to be working for a beacon. The whole point of a signal beacon is that it's an emergency measure for when normal radio communication isn't possible. Like when the comms array is out. If the comms array was functional, I would assume you could just radio for help without the beacon. It takes noticeably less than the 48 hours that Isaac estimated it would take to fix the communication system, mainly because it's a big puzzle where you place dishes that somehow rewire the power supply. Earth God's soldiers on board the Valor look like they just bought this season's battle pass for one of the more cringe skins. We picked up your escape pod number 47 and are en route to your position. This military ship, the Valor, was sent to deal with the situation on the Ishimura. So why would they pick up an escape pod first? And I would assume these guys knew what they were heading into. Yet one necromorph was able to wipe out all of them and cause the ship to crash into the Ishimura. The escape pod even has a window on the hatch so you can look into it, so they would have seen a monster inside. I found an executive shuttle on the crew deck, intact. And the log says that shuttle's missing its singularity core. It can't get us home. Wait, maybe it can. If the Valor Singularity Core is okay, I could salvage it, install it on that shuttle. Hammond found a shuttle on the crew deck they might be able to use to escape. If the Valor, which just crashed into the Ishimura, still has an intact Singularity Core on board, they could probably also just take the Ishimura's Singularity Core since it was never stated that it was destroyed. I would expect that after crashing into another ship, the Valor would be completely exposed to vacuum due to all the structural damage. But no, still holds an atmosphere just fine. To put this in perspective, it's like a ship sinking but remaining dry as a bone inside the hull. The crash also disturbed a nuke which will go off if something isn't done about it, which is the opposite of what would normally happen. Nukes are in fact sensitive physics experiments more so than a bomb. You could crush one in a trash compactor and nothing would happen. Detonation requires a specific chain reaction that is only initiated by arming the weapon. Mr. Clark? Hello? The guy who accidentally killed the captain, Dr. Kine, contacts Isaac with a proposal to do something about the marker. I'm not sure how he knows Isaac's name though. Help me get him to the Kellys. Such shit. Shoot him! Emma did get more screen time in the remake, but his death this time around makes him seem like more of an idiot. He couldn't bring himself to think of Chin as a monster and got himself killed, but not before he pushed them both into the Singularity Core, which could have destroyed it based on the example of their own ship blowing up. If the Valor is going to explode, wouldn't that destroy the Ishimura with it? Remember, the Valor is currently crashed into the Ishimura. The amount of clear glass windows that keep separating Isaac from people being killed is suspiciously high. This is what Mercer could have done to Isaac when they first met. Mercer calls it the hive mind. Nexus organism which controls these necromorphs telepathically. If we leave while the hive mind is active, well, you saw the Valor. 
If even a single necromorph escapes, humanity is finished. The hive mind doesn't really fit in with post Dead Space 1 lore, but for some unexplained reason, Kind wants to use the shuttle to take the marker back to Aegeus, which is supposed to calm the creature. This is the work of the marker influencing Kind to bring the marker back. Kind states that his own reasoning for wanting to do it is that if a single necromorph escapes from the Ishimura, then humanity is doomed, which is likely correct. I don't see any point for the marker wanting to be returned to Aegeus to be near the hive mind when its true goal is the assimilation of all of humanity in order to create a brethren moon. Turns out that fire can permanently kill a hunter, which is odd because Isaac's flamethrower sure as hell can't kill it. A helpful tentacle kills Mercer and even transports the marker to cargo and even correctly places on the conveyor system for Isaac. Daniel shows her true colors by shooting Kine right before Isaac was about to load the marker onto the shuttle. She didn't need to at that point. She could have just closed the door and left Kine on the Ishimura like she planned to do with Isaac. She also could have shot and killed Kine at any moment while Isaac was moving the marker around in the cargo hold, or before Kine even flew the shuttle into the cargo hold since she was on board the entire time. I work for EarthGov, cleaning up a very, very old mess. Step 1 of the EarthGov plan to deal with a possible marker situation. Send a CEC infiltrator on the repair mission to the Ishimura in case it had disturbed the marker. Step 2. Agent will be unable to do anything on her own if the situation is critical, and she is in no way equipped to call for assistance. Step 3. At the same time, send a military ship to the Ishimura with the exact same mission, but with no warning of what they might encounter there. The marker? This divine artifact? It was built by human hands. That's impossible. It's an alien world. The miners dug up the fucking thing. After it was planted here a few hundred years ago. This is an awful amount of classified intel for an EarthGov operative to be sharing with someone not on the payroll. I've seen how the marker fucks with your head. It must be contained. If that's the case, then don't you think that leaving Isaac, who has shown himself to be incredibly resourceful, on board the Ishimura with the marker, which he's currently being influenced by, is a really bad idea. Nicole shows up and tells Isaac that he can recall the shuttle and remote pilot it back to the Ishimura. In response, Daniel launches an escape pod from the shuttle instead of doing anything to disable the shuttle to keep Isaac from using it. This lady is a computer systems engineer and has been hacking the Ishimura again and again, and she could do nothing about this. Right about now, the marker should convince Isaac to take it to Earth using the shuttle, but it doesn't. Returning the marker to a GS-7 doesn't further its goal in any way that I can see. Also, I don't know why the marker insists on being returned to its pedestal when the chunk of planet held up by gravity tethers is about to fall on the area, destroying the marker and anything else in the same hemisphere as the impact. The marker signal changes us, recombines us, but there's a dead space in that signal. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a title. I sort of figured that once planet side, the zero gravity gameplay would be over, but there's an anti-gravity maintenance room down here for some reason. Instead of stealing the shuttle and leaving Isaac down here to die, Daniels decided to confront him and Nicole directly. She then shows Isaac the recording of Nicole he was watching before arriving on the Ishimura and tells him to watch until the end, where he finally sees Nicole kill herself. Daniels didn't think to send Isaac this file at any time after he took control of the shuttle from her. She could have done that instead of using the escape pod. In the remake, instead of this being an hallucination, Nicole was actually Dr. Cross from Hydroponics, who Isaac just forgot about completely and didn't even think of when they were planning to escape the Ishimura on the shuttle. The marker made them both see each other as their dead lover, who wanted them to return the marker to Aegeus. I don't know why Isaac, realizing the truth, somehow caused Dr. Cross to also stop hallucinating. Anyways, since there's a pane of glass between Isaac and them, Daniels kills her. Daniels tries to load the marker onto the shuttle for some reason. I'm not sure what she was going to do with it, since she already acknowledged that it was dangerous to take it from here. Doesn't matter though, since the hive mind shows up and kills her, even though her escaping with the marker would be the better outcome for it. Isaac performs a sick several thousand kilometer 360 degree spin to reach orbit in about 3 seconds. The jump scare ending isn't even a proper jump scare since everyone was expecting it. To be fair, they did include a new ending to the game that makes more sense for the sequel, but you can only get it in New Game Plus. Dead Space.